I've not done this in quite a while so decided to jump back in. Let's see what little known games you could enjoy on Commodore's Gaming Beast. Allo Allo Cartoon Fan is based on BBC's brilliant 1980s classic comedy TV series of the same name, set in France during World War II. Well, short of that cartoon fan part. That said, it's fun, so yeah, I'm lost in my own thoughts. Anyway, it's an action platformer in which you play a serious protagonist, René Artois, yes, like Stella Artois de Beer, a frightened owner of the only cafe in town, or a Michel, a leader of French resistance who canonically never says the same thing twice. It's funnier in the show than here, trust me. And in each level you must complete a task based on the series, so you have to find the painting of Madonna with the big boobies, or make contact with almost French-speaking officer Crabtree, among others. Other than that, there's various goodies that you can grab along the way and they are collected for points, but some of them can have other additional uses, like bottles used to replenish your health, or boxes and phones that you can throw at German guards and Gestapo officers too. I should really be more wary what I'm saying here, as I may be upsetting YouTube gods with some of the words. Interestingly enough, Allo Allo allows for simultaneous multiplayer, which is not something often seen in platformers, but oh so fun, when you get someone to play it with. I don't think I've seen it anywhere outside of a late Amiga game, Yo Joe. Being familiar with the show is naturally helpful, but not necessary, and if you've never seen it, you can just treat it as any other action platformer. Allo Allo may not be the best game in the genre, but it's really decent and especially with someone else. Three thousand one O'Connor's Fight is a really, really bad game. I mean, it could have been so good, the idea was there, and yet... Anyway, we'll get to that in a minute. You play as John O'Connor, who's one O away from being John Connor from The Terminator, a much more interesting and cool character to play as, especially when he started The Resistance. In theory, our John is much cooler, but sadly, that's a theory only. So you're one of six so-called space lords who fight for dominance over the space empire. The game view is divided into two, first taking a bigger part of the screen space view in which you see all the planets and an additional one with commands to use in gameplay. To simplify, 3001 is a glorified risk, but not as fun, and I say it as someone who doesn't particularly enjoy playing risk. So, what you'll mainly be doing is traveling between your planets, adjusting their production focus and moving your ships around space, setting them to either defend your locations or attack others. Combat result is based on the comparison of number of attacking and defending units, like in Risk. There is a special rule, however, if you happen to attack the planet where the leader of opposing faction, another space lord currently is, and win, you instantly defeat him and get all of his planets. The goal of the game is as simple as they come, to unite all planets under your rule. Every now and then you'll get to participate in an action sequence flying through space avoiding obstacles, which is a nice change of pace, but not enough to save this otherwise disappointing game. If you enjoy Risk, then you may find something in 3001 O'Connor's Fight to enjoy, but otherwise I'd suggest avoiding it. Imagine Galaga or Galaxian in 3D. Could be fun, right? You'd sit at the turret on your ship and annihilate waves of upcoming enemies, clearing the space of them and making it ultimately a safer place. You know, for the benefit of all. Well, perhaps there was a chance for it to happen, but it didn't. While the graphics are really not bad and 3D flat-shaded polygons and aliens do in fact come at you in waves, something went wrong along the way. Perhaps the devs forgot to play their own game to test it out, or perhaps it was just an experiment that grew in size over time, so they decided to make it a commercial release. Hard to tell, but it's not great. So, you fly forwards fighting of enemies, shooting at them with your trusty laser cannon, pew-pewing them into non-existence and there's no other way really. Cause if you miss an enemy or a few, and they pass you by, they will circle around somehow and come back from ahead again to be shot until all are dead. And it would be fun and all if they post any resistance. But they don't. They don't shoot at you at all, they don't change their movement rhythm too much either, and the only way that they can kill you is by crashing into you. But you know what? They don't really try to do that either, they fly on their pre-assigned pre-baked paths, be it forward or backwards moving, and to die you have to fail in steering and fly into them yourself. The only thing that I actually really enjoy about 3D Galax are the asteroid belt sections that you get to participate in every four waves, but even though they look nice and are a fun breather between the standard loop, it too is not enough to add excitement to this rather drab title. Nine Lives is an action platformer with a cat as a protagonist. But you being you, so one of the smartest people out there, knew that already judging by the title only, right? You play as Bobcat, 
not Bobcat, but Bob the Cat, and you have to save your beloved feline Claudette that has been kidnapped by the evil scientist's goons. The villain apparently plans to perform experiments on her, but I have no way on confirming or denying it now. How scientists' brains work is something I'm not versed with, as I'm a simple man. Anyway, you being the cat, Bobcat, and not understanding the reasoning behind the kidnapping, have to save her. The game is composed out of four uniquely themed levels, and in each you have to free a series of cats by collecting keys and unlocking pathways to progress further. Naturally, it's not only a collectibles kind of a game, and there are enemies that will stop at nothing but to hurt you. And these are all manner of cute animals, from rats through dogs to owls and even clowns, which may not be animals per se, but are they human really, or are they a nightmare inducing monster spawned in hell to haunt kids' birthday parties? You tell me. You cannot kill any of these enemies, but you can stun them, effectively stopping them for a little while by hurling your ball of string at them. Touching any of the enemies or hazards eats up a bit of your energy bar, and if it goes down to zero, you lose a life, of which there is the titular amount of. How fitting. There is only one danger in the game that can instantly kill our cat hero, so whenever you see it, make note of it, as it has to be avoided at all cost. And it's iron railings. Presentation-wise, Nine Lives is pretty good for 1990, the colors are nicely mixed, and the animation is decent, though I wouldn't mind it having few extra frames to be a bit smoother. Sadly, the game does not scroll, and flips between the screens when you reach the edge of it which not only looks jerky, but also adds a lot to already high difficulty level of the game by often having you take daredevil jumps not knowing if you will land on an enemy or a hazard. If you like exploration platformers, there's a lot to enjoy in 9 lives, especially if you're good at them. But if you're easily frustrated, it may be best to seek out a different game. Fifth Gear is a port from Atari ST, which in turn was based on C64 original. And other than that smoother hardware scrolling, few extra colors here and there and shadows, it's the same game. Which you know, on an 8-bit system was quite fun, but on the new machines it's rather disappointing. I mean it looks and feels great when you first launch it, but the more you play it, the more you realize that it promises a lot, but delivers very little. It's not the worst game out there, but don't expect to replay it often either. Theoretically, you're taking part in illegal street races, those kind of races that have no rules governing them, and those that do not require the same number of contestants that left the start to arrive at the end. It's just unnecessary. Simply put, you must beat the clock, so you always race off from the start line, need to get to the certain turning point and then get back to where you started from, all within allotted time. It's not as easy as it seems though, as not only the tracks are full of obstacles, but there are also other cars on the road, collision with which can jeopardize your entire race. You're not a road victim, however, and your bullet is equipped with a machine gun. It doesn't shoot too fast and is not overly powerful, but can be exchanged and your car upgraded at various service points. So missile launchers, helium tires or rapid fire upgrade are a few that you'll be working towards getting. And you start the game with $10,000 and earn more money by eliminating other cars and surviving races. And while you may want to splurge it all on upgrades straight away, keep in mind that you always need to have some saved up for refueling and repairs. And why would you need to repair? Well, did you really thought that you were the only one capable of firing? The graphics are nice and scrolling is rather good too, but the main problem with the game comes from the controls. Games live or die by them. And these are way too sensitive, making the fifth gear more annoying than fun. A-Train on the Amiga is actually third title in Japanese series of business simulation games originally known as Take the A-Train. In A-Train, you're in charge of your own railway company and its expansion. And guess what? You have no rivals. I know, crazy. You're playing against yourself only. And really, it's just you in the city in an open-ended game where you have to get as rich as possible and help the city grow in the process. Because the bigger the city gets, the more possibilities for profit. So, you build railway stations, connections and you can transport passengers and building materials. First are more profitable, and the latter allow city to grow as the materials are used for building, which in turn can have positive impact on your passenger transport demands. Funny enough, this mechanic is exactly opposite to how it works in real life, where passengers always bring in the least dough. City's expansion is automatic and you have very little direct control of it, other than being able to invest in some buildings of your own, like hotels for instance, which can prove to be another source of income. On the surface, it may appear that a train is very simplistic, but there's a lot of deep underlying mechanics in play here and it's a really rewarding title if given time and attention. Presentation-wise, it's perhaps not on SimCity 2000 levels, but the cities, sprites and trains are rather nice, even if repeated often, and overall well fit to slower, more micromanagement focused gameplay.
Abduction story was born out of goodwill, and as usual when there's nothing supporting said will, something goes wrong along the way and it becomes corrupted. So, the earth is on the verge of becoming completely barren because of the heavy pollution, you know, kinda like it will be soon here in reality, to combat this a special organization codenamed EGB-5 was formed, and research and development station built in outer space. Its only purpose was finding a way to save earth to research a solution for the impending ecological doom. What most didn't know, however, was that the station made a secret deal with the aliens. In exchange for their tech, that would help us to save the planet, they received numerous samples of plants, animals and even humans, naturally abducted against their will, all obviously under a veil of secrecy. For as long as the deal lasted, the EGB-5 kept showing very promising results and get closer and closer to a permanent solution for Earth's pollution, until it was accidentally discovered that the aliens were fooling us all along and they needed all those samples to create cloned cyborg humans to send them to Earth so that they would mix with the population and find a way to wipe us from within and then prepare the planet for aliens to take over and settle on. Upon this uncomfortable discovery, it is agreed that the alien's base of operations from which they conduct the experiments has to be destroyed because by aligning with them we've actually hastened our potential destruction. But doing so is not easy, especially that it can't be accessed just like that willy-nilly. So the plan is created to pick and set up a suitable person as an abductee that will destroy the base from within. That person is you, playing as Travis Connor, former head of Earth's R&D company Syntech. Abduction is a top-down point-and-click adventure which will see you navigating corridors of an alien base, uncovering its secrets and looking for a way to destroy it. If you're someone who enjoys adventure games, this one's definitely not to skip. Alien Target is a rather obscure Polish sci-fi action arcade release and one of the better games from the country to come out some late in Amiga's life. It's also a side-scrolling first-person shoot-em-up in the vein of titles like Operation Wolf or Cabal, leaning towards the wolf more as your character is not visible on the screen. A scientist, Professor Jack L. Choker, invented a time machine, which as most time machines do, allowed for traveling to both, future and past. Unfortunately, in one of the early travels he unknowingly brought back something, namely aggressive aliens who by then learned where the Earth was. And let me tell you, it took him but a short minute to conquer the planet, that's how unprepared we were. At that point, when all of the planet's militaries failed, the only possible solution for our blue marble to survive, the only way to save it against overwhelming and technically more advanced force, was to resort to employing help of the alien hunters. Hunters such as yourself, my brave, tough and more dangerous than Riddick viewer. It's not gonna be a walk in the park though, as the aliens stole the time machine and now appropriate it to conquer us in all times, making sure that we're not gonna be able to escape their strong and slimy grasp. They made one crucial mistake though, they underestimated you. And that was what will ultimately bring their demise. So, using the similar time machine, you'll be hunting them in ancient times, in the 19th century, in the present and future too. Four stages, each placed in a different time and setting. The new enemy appears on the screen every few seconds and his location is always indicated on your scanner. And you have to direct yourself to it, scrolling in the appropriate direction, making sure to dispose of it and any others before you run out of energy. Keeping tabs on all of them so that they wouldn't overwhelm you. And since we're on the subject, you can replenish the energy, ammo and your grenades by shooting tokens containing set power-ups. Naturally, Alien Target is neither most ambitious nor the best shoot em up out there, but it's decent enough to provide some fun and a lot of action. And if you enjoy those crosshair mouse controlled games, you're gonna like it. Apache Flight is a vertically scrolling shooter in vein of Swift but nowhere near the same quality. It doesn't offer a jeep or any other ground vehicle to play as really, in fact, there's no multiplayer, so it's an entirely single person experience. And all you have at your disposal is the copter. The game features two different kinds of weapons, an unlimited ammo chain gun used for flying targets and limited in number missiles for combating ground based enemies. Not the worst idea out there, but the problem is that they're not switchable but are picked depending on how you use the fire button. If you keep tapping it, the helicopter will be using standard ammo for air targets, and if you hold it, it will switch to missiles. Now, if you ever played an Amiga game using similar control scheme, you know very well what I'm getting at here, and it's nothing good. The delay from when you go from standard shot to missiles may not be overly long, but it's plenty enough for you to be hit with a stray bullet or crash into an enemy. In shoot em ups, every fraction of a second counts, and each wasted works against you. The four mentioned missiles come in two flavors, first we've covered already and the second are heat seeking guided ones and these, when available, are always used up first. 
Your chopper also relies on the fuel, which it constantly uses up in an ungodly amount, so you'll need to hover over numerous scattered around the game world fuel depots to refill it. Background and enemies graphics are rather nice, not top of the line for 1992, nowhere near that, but neat and clean nonetheless. Sounds are decent too, but nothing to write home about and story? Well, let's just say that in Apache's flights lore, there's peace on the world. Yep, all over it. And it took us a while to agree to it, but we've made it and all nations live in harmony. But just because we're all good, high-fiving each other left and right, doesn't mean that there's no evil in the world at all. And an unknown terrorist group stole all of our now leftover atomic weapons and we have to stop them. And by we, I mean you, but that goes without saying. So yeah, that's your motivation. Oh, and since I failed to mention it earlier, the controls are a bit floaty in this one, so we require getting used to. Keep that in mind. Artura is a flick scrolling action platformer, and oh my days is it bad. You play as Artura, a son of King Arthur Pendragon, and you must save Nimue, beautiful apprentice to Merdin, from the clutches of your evil half-sister Morgos. So, it kinda touches on the mythos of King Arthur, but also strays from it quite considerably. Whatever, it's a game we shouldn't look too deep into it really. So, you'll explore the Morgaus stronghold, fight of hundreds upon hundreds of her guards and odd creatures. I mean ghouls, spiders, bats, goblins, barbarians or even giant rats, you name it. There will be nothing out of ordinary and you'll mow through this all the freaking time. And literally mow, as the pace at which you throw your seemingly unlimited hand axes at them can only be compared to a lawnmower blades, cutting through them like they would cut through weeds. As you traverse the huge game, in which I must add is very easy to get lost in, you'll find runes, which are all necessary for your final confrontation with Morgals, to grant you powers to defeat her. There's six of these runes, and there are scattered around four maze-like levels the game is composed of. Artura feels like an 8-bit game in 16-bit game's clothing. It heavily relies on the mapping, which you will have to do, which you will have to do not to get lost, and in the same time, you're overwhelmed by an onslaught of enemies, effectively making it difficult to map the darn game. And I do realize that it also released on C64 and Amstrad CPC among others, so it's playable on those Biden low-end systems too, but I expected much more from an Amiga version. What's worse, despite the sprites being rather nicely looking and very unique from one another, their animation is just terrible. There seems to be 3-4 frames dedicated to movement and even less so to attacks, and I mean here both, enemies and our hero. So the feeling of jerkiness sets in from when you launch the game and never lets go until you turn it off. Artura is definitely a title fans of action platformers should check out, but everyone else would do much better skipping it and playing something better. A pretty turbulent restart for the Amiga series, don't you think? Some games here were definitely rightfully obscure and forgotten. I mean, Amiga was such a capable system, it pains me to see how the power was wasted at times. Still, few bad eggs don't spoil all of what we've covered today, so what do you think of today's selection? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.